was, I'm thinking that it was about two or three months ago. It was right around the time we were getting ready to do Big Sur. I was on Twitter, as I want to be, and I saw Howard Cameron there. And I figured, like most people like that, that I would tweet, I would be ignored. Because men tend to do that to me anyway. But they don't even have to be famous. They don't even have to be iconic. They don't even have to be like superstars that I've admired like my entire life. No, they can just be regular men before me. But this wasn't just a regular man. This was an icon, a man that has been a hero of mine since. I don't think there was ever a time when I walked into the play, what was called the playroom at the Green Acres Hotel in La Chaux, New York, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and did not put a quarter in that jukebox and play at least one of your songs in my three picks every single time. I mean, that's absolute. So anyway, so I reached out to him on Twitter, and lo and behold, what did he do? He retweeted me, and he favorited my tweet. Uh, and then I did it again, and he did it again. And then I wrote to him, and you know what? He wrote me back. He followed me back. Uh, and so it took me about at least three or four tweets before I said, Howard, will you come? And not for one minute, truthfully, I swear, not for one minute did I expect he would say yes. Howard lives in Seattle. Wow. Howard and Michelle came down from no. Seattle just for us. Oh, wow. desperate to sell a CD and a book that wouldn't do that. I mean, th this is just extraordinary. <laughs> extraordinary. And, and I had the, the great good fortune of, of, of tweeting with him back. I mean, but as soon as I asked, he said yes. I mean, there wasn't even a hesitation. And, and not only did he say yes, he said he'd be honored. Wow. He's humble. He's a mensch. <laughs> so, okay, so... And, and then, about two weeks ago, I had the great good fortune of, of speaking with him on the phone for the first time. And we, took, we were on the phone for almost two hours, and he told the greatest story. So we are so beyond blessed. And he really didn't want to come and sing. He really wanted to come and read from his About to Drop memoir. And I really, really twisted his arm. And I am beyond grateful because I was at Suzanne Wong's birthday party not too long ago, and I was standing with Eric Schwartz, who's played for us. And Eric said that he would be thrilled, honored, and happy to come and, and, and accompany Howard. And so I kind of twisted Howard's arm a little harder. And then, and then Eric brought Topher, Christopher, Christopher. I was like, isn't his name Topher? Yeah, well, Christopher. Yeah, I didn't know why he was calling him Christopher. Christopher, what's your last name? Al. 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 Alice. Like, Al like Allie? Like, like in Wonderland. Like Alice. Alice. Yeah. Christopher Alice, Topher Alice is here to play the box. What is it called? The Cajon. The Cajon. Those are balls. Those are cajones. Cajones is different than Cajon. I've got balls. I've got a box and balls. So, so anyway, enough of that. Enough about me. Okay. Okay. All right. Here we go. Let's let's get to Howard. For those of you who came here having not read any of my emails <laughs> or seen any of my Facebook posts, <laughs> how the hell did you manage that? Okay, then you might not know that Howard Kalin is a founding member of the Turtles. And Sang all those songs. <laughs> okay, moved to LA in his youth. He won the Bank of America Fine Arts Award at 16. Shortly thereafter, he graduated early high school as valedictorian and began a scholarship at UCLA. There he enjoyed his time in the university's radio station even more than academia. Aha! So when Destiny called and his weekend combo was signed to produce its first record, Howard quit school and decided to take his chances. You could bet right there. The Turtles went on to phenomenal success. Do I need to tell you that? Yeah. With top ten singles and for over five years of chart of charted recordings, they performed all over the world, and their signature hit, so happy yeah, 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 together, knocked the Beatles, Penny Lane, out of the number one slot in America. Oh, that's crazy! It's unbelievable. Okay, the Turtles were fixtures on television, appearing on the Ed Sullivan Show. 
a number of times, as well as this Mother's Brother show, and I'm so upset that Lee French is in the air, because yeah. Lee was, I share a little tea with Goldie, and Howard told me, I'm sorry, Michelle, he had a crush on Lee, but that was like a million years ago, so it's okay. <laughs> but anyway, um, I had a crush on her too. Um, okay, in 1970, they were selected to be the first rock and roll band ever to play the White House, Patricia Nixon's birthday. Wow. You went wow. to Nixon's White House, Howard! Hey, leave me alone. Oh, God! Okay, and the my favorite venue in the whole world. Okay, I got to go when I yeah. Um, okay, so when the band broke up at the end of 1970, Howard and his partner Mark Bowman signed on for what? Frank Zappa's Woo! Mothers of Invention. Okay, and I just oh, I have to show you. I got for my birthday <laughs> yesterday. My old boyfriend sent me, but it's not one you're in. But it was a Zappa DVD. <laughs> I love Zappa. <laughs> and I loved you guys with Zappa. Oh my God. Okay, five albums in a motion and, and 200 motels later came from that beautiful <laughs> partnership, as did the Gnome de Plume, Flo and Eddie. And there's Eddie. Yes. Oh. And it's because they were not allowed to legally use their own name. That's so crazy. You're going to have to tell us a little of that story. Okay, so four albums followed. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Then they also produced many albums for other bands and artists, as well as singing background on over 100 albums. Wow. Flo and Eddie could be heard singing with John Lennon, Bruce Springsteen, The Ramones, Blondie, Duran Duran, The Psychedelic Furs, T-Rex, Alice Cooper, and dozens more. In the 80s, Rock Steady with Flo and Eddie was recorded in Kingston, Jamaica, and the partners began writing comedy scripts with Chris Beard, Larry Gilbert, and Gary Gottlieb. Simultaneously, they began writing regularly featured columns for Cream, Phonograph Record Magazine, and the infamous LA Free Press. Flo and Eddie began a career in the radio industry with their own show on LA's famous KMET, then moving on to KROQ with their own Sunday night program of celebrity zaniness. And for anyone who's heard of Flo and Eddie, you know what that's about. Ten years later, they would find themselves on Radio Daily following Howard Stern on KROQ. Throughout his career, Howard has appeared as an actor. He was featured in the motion picture Get Crazy, starring Malcolm McDowell and Daniel Stern as Captain Cloud, a nickname to which he still answers. <laughs> also, he portrayed an Orthodox minister who married Laura to, St to, to Stav Stravros in the dream sequence in General Hospital, an old hippie on Suddenly Susan, and a younger hippie on The Gary Shandling Show. <laughs> and we want you, Gary. We still want you. In 1985, the old lawsuits were finally settled, and the name The Turtles reverted to Howard and his partner. After 15 years in litigation, as well as all of the master recordings they made, thanks to Burger King, the NFL, Sony PlayStation, and countless other television commercials and motion pictures, the Turtles catalog remains a staple for licensing reproduction in the 21st century. Uh -huh. In the mid-90s, Howard turned his attention to collecting and writing of dark fantasy and science fiction. He scribed two short stories by way of experimentation, and both were published in the best-selling anthologies Phantoms of the Night and Forbidden Acts. He also currently pens the widely read Eddie's Media Corner on the official website, theturtles.com. In 2001, Howard wrote a treatment for a very short film about his first night on tour in London. And I hope he's going to tell us about that. After bringing it to his good friend, um, Howard Bronson, for input, the project was lengthened and shot as a one-hour movie. The following year, scenes were added, and it was back into the movie studio once again, and it became Howard's first feature-length film, My Dinner with Jimmy. And guess what Jimmy he's talking about? Hendrix! Okay. <laughs> the Turtles continued to perform, doing between 60 and 75 concerts each year. Howard lives in Seattle, Washington, and commutes to Hollywood, where he anxiously anticipates the release of his first major, no, of his autobiography, I'm getting ahead of myself, mm. Shell Shocked, which is what we're going to hear from today. It comes out in April from Back Deep Books. Okay, I, um, I, I don't want to, I, ladies, I am, I am proclaimed, <laughs> over the moon, honored, humbled, and beyond thrilled to introduce Alan Kidd. Yay! Let's mic you up. Mic me up. Wow. I'd like to introduce my band, the Roach Clips. <laughs> Let's see. 
Now, okay. Uh, um, I'm going to just start at the beginning because I really don't know what to do. Uh, this book is called Shell Shocked, as Vicki said. It's kind of a history of, uh, of my life, the turtles, the mothers of invention, and, uh, and afterward, and all the, the things that we've done in between. But uh, I'm happy to say that it's got a brilliant introduction. If you don't like the book, buy the book for the introduction. <laughs> I didn't write the introduction. It's Penn Gillette, and he's brilliant. It's funny. It's obscene. And uh, there are more F words here, more bombs that I could possibly drop. So I'm, I'm going to skip that one and then I'll let you enjoy that if, if you can. But the book kicks off with, uh, with this. And if that doesn't scare the hell out of the readers, nothing will. Um, the first line was, I was snorting coke on Abraham Lincoln's desk in the White House. <laughs> well, I was. Yes, that Abraham, that Abraham Lincoln and that White House, a bunch of hairy peacenik dopers from California, though we were. It seems that Tri Trisha Nixon, daughter of Tricky Dick himself, was a fan of the turtles and had requested our presence. Our first instinct? You gotta be kidding. No way in hell. <laughs> Yeah, here we were, our noses vacuuming lines off the surface of Honest Abe's very own workspace. <laughs> We'd gone through several managers during the past five years and had been on the charts far more often than anybody would have ever guessed, considering that we were the only ones looking out for us, and that White Whale Records wasn't much of a label. There had been the folk rock years, and we had been lucky enough to score a few big hits. We were among the earliest children of Bob Dylan, putting our cover version of his tune at Ain't Me Babe into the top ten. Then we become the good time music boys, influenced by the love and spoonful, and determined not to protest anything. Uh, we've made it to number one with a song that's still recognized today as one of the classic rock and roll love songs of all time, Happy Together Indeed. And now finally we had engineered our own success with Eleanor, our first self-penned top ten record, and You Showed Me, which we had changed from a Beatlesque rocker into a lush ballad. We were lucky and we knew it. Of course, now we had the big time management to prove it. Gone were the friends of friends. We realized that we really weren't in any position to manage ourselves. And hello to our new superstar management team. We had been courted successfully by Ron de Blasio and Jeff Wald, who were at the time top reps for the Campbell Silver Cosby Corporation. That's right, Bill Cosby. Mr. Pudding Pops, <laughs> that fucking Albert. <laughs> Bill, his own self, was a full partner in the firm that represented him, and us, and others, and his sweaters. And he was the number, he was the number one comic in America. Across the hall of the office of the appropriately named Artie Mogul, who ran the in-house record company Tetragrammaton, which was home to Deep Purple and more. Of course, he had nothing to do with us. <coughs> Neither did Mr. Cosby, but his name promised to open a lot of doors in Hollywood, and that was exactly what we needed. But what, I asked, could these guys bring to the table for a band that had been around the block and hypothetically overstayed their welcome? <laughs> well, we didn't have to wait long. We had heard through the grapevine that the Turtles were Trisha's favorite band, and we all had a good chuckle over that. <laughs> Old man Nixon was the creepiest dick of his generation. <laughs> the least popular president among the under 30 crowd that had ever been, and a killer of our young men and women as far as we were concerned. We were deeply anti-war and deeply self-conscious. We were Nixonites, that's for sure. We were everything he stood against. So when the hand-engraved invitations to perform at Trisha's coming out party arrived at the Cosby office, we were none too thrilled. In fact, we flat out refused to play, and they started to freak out. Oh, what do you mean you refuse to play? Who the hell do you think you are? This isn't a political thing. It's like the goddamn royal pl proclamation, you idiots. You play the White House because you're an American, blah, blah, blah. And they shamed us into it. Not only that, but to add insult to injury, management was now requesting that we each go out and buy a classy new suit. <laughs> can't play for the president looking like the sewer rats that you really are. <laughs> Perfect. There it was again. Too bad Johnny Barbada, our ex-drummer, wasn't drumming in the band anymore. He would have loved the sight of us clumsily trying on the very Brioni suits that he'd been trying to get us to wear for three and a half years. <laughs> this is the way we dress. I, you know, I don't care about Italian suits. Now we had each bought one. So talk about fish out of water. 
Uh, came the big day, May 10th, 1969, we flew into Washington, D.C. on the taxpayer's dollar. And there we were met by five separate cars replete with drivers all flying the American flag and taken directly to the White House. Once there, we discovered that the Secret Service had dossiers on each of us. <laughs> <laughs> they kept us in a holding lounge while going through our intimate details individually. And after we had all been cleared, it was time to unload the equipment that we had brought with us all the way from LA. But we didn't do the unloading. Instead, the Secret Service guys did. And they didn't know the first thing about large equipment cases. So as they begin to unload the trap case from the drum set, the large case that carries the snare drum, percussion goodies, and miscellaneous items, they tipped it to one side and unknowingly triggered the tiny switch on the electronic metronome tuner that we always carried with us. <laughs> the guns. <laughs> Up against the wall. Oh, we went there. Up against that wall it was as they carted off our little black box and we stood there, a rock group inside of enemy territory, the Nixon White House, looking down the crosshairs from the wrong direction. And guys in hazmat suits were brought in to deal with our little plastic tuner and their freak out escalated yet another notch when somebody hit the tuning switch and the 440 cycle A tone started shrieking from the metro. Can you get an A? <laughs> now it was tick, tick, tick. <laughs> the term shitting a brick comes to me. My knees were shaking and the sweat was rolling off my face and it was only May. The fucking cherry blossoms were blooming on America's lawn and I was about to be shot for treason. <laughs> we looked at each other and we looked at them. It was like a peck and paw movie. I could almost hear the feds mumbling to each other as they set to work, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. I only perceived a gushing in my ears like I was underwater. The only other sound I recall was my way too fast heartbeat. That little fog started to set in, the one where you think you might just pass out. Well, now the guns were cocked and ready to fire, and they schlepped off our little plastic box for further examination. When it returned ten minutes later, the faceplate had been pried off and the box was dripping water. Oh, what? It's a metronome, they declared. Good work, guys. <laughs> that was the longest ten minutes of my life. Many months later, we received a check from the White House for seventeen dollars. Wow. <laughs> so the party itself was pretty crazy. I heard reports from a couple of the band members who had actually gone up to the roof of the White House with some CIA guys to smoke a joint before a sound check. <laughs> but I wasn't part of that bunch. In fact, I actually read it in, uh, in Johnny Barbeda, our drummer's autobiography. <laughs> Somebody had to test those mics. I guess that's what I was doing when they were upstairs. However, later, when we returned to do the show, we were given Pres President Lincoln's library to use as our dressing room. Unbelievable. In fact, we were told that the entire first floor was okay for us to explore as long as we didn't enter the private quarters. Everyone on staff was to let us have the run of the place, and we did. It was amazing. It was amazing. We were loaded. I from smoking pot back at the hotel and a wee bit tipsy from all the French champagne that was being freely dispensed and we were roaming around the most important home of America, unsupervised. <laughs> <laughs> one, uh, one member of our crew still had a few tricks up his sleeve, however, and not only did I get to take a precious toax of his mystery stash before the show started, but we were actually able to lay out lines of coke on Mr. Lincoln's desk. <laughs> oh As the powder flew up my nose, I wondered if this was exactly what the founding fathers had in mind. <laughs> land of the free indeed. Well, I, I felt pretty free. Yeah. And on top of the world. Now I think back, geez, they must have had cameras. Yeah. <laughs> but back then the thought never crossed my mind. Uh, the show was wonderful, what can I say? We were always a great band, and although our other vocalist, my career-long partner, Mark Bowman, had a few balance issues. <laughs> he, he fell off the stage a few times. <laughs> He always does. He always really does. 
much to the amusement of our president. The actual concert was a huge success. Just looking around the room at the dignitaries, the emissaries, and the luminaries was like LSD to a stoner Democrat like me. That made things even more fun. I was smiling from ear to ear. Even the Temptations, who were also on the bill, were drinking and singing and laughing right along with us. And we were funny. We didn't hold back just because of the venue. Hell, I thought we'd been thrown out of better places than this. <laughs> But of course we hadn't been. <laughs> Jokes at America's expense, literally. Uh, right after the show, Mark decided to hit on Lucy Baines Johnson. <laughs> Do you remember what she looked like? My partner is nuts. Uh, LBJ's daughter, which would have been questionable under any circumstances. But especially so with her husband, Pat Nugent, swearing <laughs> off at Mark from inches away. They were nose to nose. Spittle was flying. I'm not exactly sure how peace was restored between them, but man, there was an almost incident that was happily avoided. History would have loved that one. Trisha and her friends seemed to love us. Uh, most of her acquaintances were college kids and probably unbeknownst to her, were busy spending their evening passing out subversive SDS flyers. <laughs> It was amazing. And much to our relief, Tricky Dick was off on a foreign mission somewhere killing our troops. So he never made an appearance, and I've always been thankful for that. Uh, I'm absolutely positive, considering our states of mind that evening, that I or some other equally messed up turtle uh, would have given him an earful of our contempt and probably would have ended up in Gitmo. <laughs> Snap, they took some pictures. One shows five shaggy guys, one psychedelic road manager, Ron de Blasio, Jeff Wald, and his wife, Helen Reddy. <laughs> and they're in the center looking like a Hummel figurine in white Trisha Nixon herself. Another depicts only four shaggy guys, all the turtles except me, and Trisha. That one made it to the cover of Parade magazine. Read into my missing visage what you will. Was I up to something subversive? I wish I could say I was, but I was probably just exploring the presidential restroom or something. It kind of makes you all proud to be an American, though, doesn't it? How in the world had I ever gotten here? Then the book goes on and follows me back uh, through my life and through some of the most uh, more important incidents, like um, uh, our joining Frank Zappa and uh, our years on the road with uh, Flo and Eddie. Um, and uh, all the people that we worked with in between. And so there are stories here about Alice Cooper and Bruce Springsteen and the Ramones and Blondie and everybody else that we sang with over the years. Uh, the book comes out in April. It's called Shell Shocked. It's from Hal Leonard Press, uh, and Backbeat is the imprint. And uh, I don't know anything about books or how to work them or how to even read them. So I'm. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here. I thank you. I thank the Roach. And Aaron figured, and Vicky figured that since we were all here together, we might as well play some music. Yes! <laughs> yes! We will gladly do if you guys promise to sing along. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. These are all hits from the past. Right? So, Frank Zappa. I don't think we're doing the Zappa stuff today. But uh, let's see what these guys know, and then I'll start singing, and you guys sing along with me. Oh, it's a little something like this. Something like this. Between me and you, I do. I think about you day and night. It's only right to think about the girl you love and hold her tight. So happy together. the day. 
dice, it had to be The only one for me is you, and you for me So happy together